before we start, I just have a question for you all. What do the following images have in common? Have a think. Composites, okay, we have composites. Anything else? Yeah? They all need to be impact resistant. They all? Need to be impact resistant. Well, yes, if you know what I'm talking about, then yes, you already know that they need to have impact resistance. Um, but yeah, so the main point here is from prosthetics to athletics, from the soles of shoes through to seals in spaceships, all of these are examples where a soft polymeric-based material uh, has been used uh, in a scenario where it has to be or has to withstand impact loading conditions. So that's the purpose of my talk today. We're going to hopefully learn a bit more about uh, what impact resistant materials are like with a specific focus on uh, polymers and their uh, physics and what makes them challenging to study. So why do we need to care about impact resistance of polymers? Why, why care? I care because it's my job. But why should you care? Hopefully, I'm going to convince you that impact events are a regular occurrence in your own lives, starting with the kind of necessary. So if you are to go out jogging, then very simply put, your shoes have been designed to withstand the impact of you running. Through to a nuisance, if you've ever encountered this in packaging, you'll know that any time polystyrene is used in packaging, it's a, it's a nuisance to clean up afterwards. It's there to help protect your package devices, whatever you've ordered from damage, but it can be a nuisance. It can be costly. If you've ever had the misfortune of you know, dropping your device, your phone, without a protective case on, then you know for a split second your heart stops and you wonder whether your screen has been cracked or not. It can be costly if you have to replace the screen or, God forbid, your actual device and through to life-threatening as well. So in the most extreme cases, we need uh, protection to protect passengers, whether that's in cars or aircraft, but also from kind of impact sports. So here we have uh, uh, American football where players have to wear kind of protective equipment to, to protect themselves against injury. So these are some of the most common examples of why we need impact-resistant materials, and each of them are an example of using soft materials as well for protection. They're widely used from vibration isolations and dampers for buildings through to kind of packaging, through to body armor and spacecraft components. In each of those cases, they have to withstand impact loading conditions. And these conditions can lead to and can occur at a wide range of temperatures. So this makes it especially challenging to understand their behavior because not only is the condition varying speeds, varying temperatures, the fact that when you do impact the materials, it leads to a rise in temperature within the material as well. So there's a very complex behavior that's not very well understood still. And because it's not very well understood, it prevents us from optimizing kind of how these materials are used to build products and different applications. The aim of my research is to essentially better understand the behavior of soft polymers and how they are ultimately used in various applications. And I've previously explained the why it's important because they're widely used, but their complex behavior makes it hard for us to fully understand how we can use them. Specifically, my research looks at two kind of facets. One is the experimental side and one is the computational modeling, so the computer simulations. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on the experimental side of the research. I'm going to present three challenges that I face and three potential solutions to those challenges that have been made possible through to the research activities. First challenge, different impact speeds lead to different mechanical response. So you can see here we have a polycarbonate, so it's a type of polymer, being impacted against a steel rod and it deforms heavily. But the deformation depends on the speed. So here is 100 meters per second, 150 meters per second, slight more curvature. And then at 250 meters per second, there's like clearly serious plastic deformation. So it's changed shape completely forever. That's just purely by changing the impact speed. So how can we better understand this behavior? For reference, this kind of high-speed camera, we can actually go up to 1 million frames per second. One way, I promise this is like one of the only graphs that I have, so don't worry. So one of the solutions is that we can draw parallels between how the material behaves 
at low speeds and low temperatures versus at ambient temperatures, so like room temperature and high speeds. What I've shown in the graph is the solid lines, the colored solid lines, represent the low speed, low temperature experiments. And then the dashed lines of the same color are, you know, same material, but at room temperature at higher speeds. So you can see there is a similar behavior, not quite exactly the same, but there's a similar behavior, there's similar trends that you can see between the behaviors. And that helps to draw kind of analogies between the high speed ambi uh, ambient experiments and the low speed, low temperature experiments. This is done for polycarbonate, which was the material that was impacted in the previous slide, but it can be used for all sorts of material, whether that's unfilled, filled with glass fillers, or even rubber materials. So, so a wide variety of materials can be used, and uh, the, these kind of analogies can be made. But why is this possible? So I'm going to take you back to a bit of a kind of theory that underpins this. Polymer, for those of you who don't know, is essentially a long vine-like uh, molecule that's made up of repeating smaller units. And like a vine, they, the chains themselves can be uh, branched, they can have knots, they can have entanglements, and essentially this kind of complicates the structure of the material. So if you were to stretch or compress the material, then these kind of features need to be overcome for the material to actually stretch or compress. In order to overcome these features, either you have to try and pull or squeeze really slowly, so there's sufficient time for these kind of chains to move around, or you increase the temperature, which provides more energy uh, to the material and allows the motion to occur. So this is kind of where that the physical underpinning for the analogy comes from. There is a similarity between low speed deformation and high temperature deformation. And vice versa, you can make the connection that there's a similarity between uh, low temperature behavior and high speed behavior. And so here I've used the phrase um, strain rate. Um, so low strain rate behavior and high strain rate behavior. So for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of strain, I've got my one and only equation in this um, presentation. You deform your material, whether you stretch it or you compress it, and it's just a change in length over the original length. And strain rate is just the rate of change of strain. So how quickly does that strain happen? So it's another way of saying speeds. So second challenge then. When we perform impact experiments, they can lead to significant temperature rises in the material. As I've said before, the, the temperature can affect the behavior of the material itself. So this is important to understand. And we use a combination of the high-speed cameras and also thermal cameras to better understand this. And so one of the solutions is to not just go straight at the high-speed impact experiment. We take a step back and lower the speeds and understand in isolation what the temperature-rise behavior is like in tension and compression at slower speeds. By understanding in isolation their behavior and how the temperature can rise, we can basically feed the results of these experiments into kind of computer models and simulations to help us better understand the high speed results. So at the top are experiments in tension, and at the bottom is an experiment in compression. And you can see that there is also a difference between the higher speed experiment, where a lot of heat is generated in the material, versus the lower speed tension experiment where there is enough time for heat to kind of leave the material and get dissipated into the environment. For reference, this thermal camera can go up to 1,000 frames per second, so it's quite high. Another solution potentially is to create new experiments to better understand the temperature rise. So here we can use a kind of oven that can decrease temperature, increase temperature. So here you decrease the temperature to recreate the um, response that the material sees when it's impacted at a high speed and we can basically simulate the temperature rises that would occur and basically study the behavior at a slower speed. And we can point you know, different tools and different equipment at the slower speed experiment that wouldn't be available to us at a high speed experiment. The third challenge that we have with uh, material behavior is that if you fill the material with anything, then the orientation of the fill fillers will affect the results. So here we have short glass rods inside the overall material. 
And when the manufacturer makes this material, they basically melt it, put the filler in, the glass uh, rods, and then they kind of, um, it's, it's kind of extruded out. So it's, it flows out in, a, in one direction. And that causes the rods to kind of align in that one direction. And that means if you cut your sample from the, the direction that's aligned to the manufacturing process, the behavior would be very different to if you were to cut your sample 90 degrees to that um, orientation. So here, you can see that more clearly with the results of the high-speed experiments, where here, the fillers are 90 degrees to this uh, direction of impact. You can actually see some light, I think, believe, uh, which I believe is ref refracted from the kind of glass fillers. It's possible to see some effects in this material that's not possible to see in that uh, material. So how can we better understand the effect of the orientation in the material? Well, there are multiple ways to do this. It's a series of experiments. First one is basically you get the material sample cut from two orientations, and you oscillate it at different frequencies, different speeds, and different temperatures, and kind of see what behavior changes, like how does it change. We can do low-speed experiments, vary the temperature. Here, we use the same oven, but also using liquid nitrogen. We can do medium speed experiments. Here we use a hydraulic system, which has hydraulic fluid to help uh, compress the sample quicker. We can use gas guns and high speed experiments. So these are still lower speed than what I showed earlier with the high speed camera, but it's kind of increasing in speed and gets us to understand um, incrementally how the behavior changes. We can also combine the gas gun high speed experiments with liquid nitrogen and do low temperature high speed experiments, which is a novel capability. And so we go down to minus 80 degrees Celsius. And ironically, we are limited by the rubber tube that we are using for this experiment because it's polymer based and it has restrictions on the temperature that it can be used at. Summarizing solutions involve a lot of experimentation, collecting the results of these simpler experiments and then feeding it into uh, kind of uh, computer models and simulations to help us better understand and predict the behavior in future. To summarize, there are a number of challenges with the approaches and uh, what we face in our research. The conventional experiments are not suitable for polymers. The behavior depends on the speed and the temperature, and then the temperature affects the material itself, so there's an interplay there. And the analogy that I was talking about can only be used for simple polymers. However, there are some opportunities as well. So we can design and build new experiments. We can uh, develop computer models using the results of simpler um, experiments. And we can also collaborate with other researchers and kind of approach the problem from different angles. So my grand vision for this particular type of research is that we'll be able to reduce, funnily enough, the number of experiments that we do, focus on simpler experiments, and use the data that we collect from the simple experiments to build better computer models to simulate and predict the behavior. Because essentially, this will help us to save money and time and help us to innovate more efficiently. And these challenges and opportunities obviously keep us all engaged and employed, and most importantly, in the research community funded. Conclusion, um, it's important to understand the impact behavior of soft materials. They're widely used, and the behavior is challenging. So that kind of motivates the research that we're doing. There are a number of challenges that we face when doing high-speed experiments, but they can be overcome by doing uh, different things, approaching it experimentally from different ways. And there is still much more to learn. And so I have a few acknowledgments for people who have helped out. Thank you all for listening.